Sometime around this script, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart just came out a couple hours ago, and it's got a lot of people talking. I can't really say anything about it since I'm one of those non-owning PS5 peasants, but I think the game looks gorgeous, and especially in 4K60, and just by looking at the gameplay alone, this game might be the best Ratchet game as, as of late. I don't really have anything else to say since I don't have any prior attachment to the Ratchet and Clank series. I was more of a Jack and Daxter and Sly Cooper fan anyway. But a couple months ago, I decided to buy the Ratchet and Clank trilogy be along with some other games with it because it was five games and it was only twenty dollars. And why wouldn't you want to buy it? I, I decided to buy them so I can prepare myself for Rift Apart and what I should be expecting for that game. So to be somewhat relevant, I decided to talk about the 19-year-old game instead of the one that just came out, just to give my perspective as a newcomer to the series. And I feel like I'm going to be asked this a lot. Yes, I know there's a lot of games spanning throughout the series. The original trilogy, the future saga, the games that were developed by High Impact Games, the other PS3 games, the modern games. There was even a mobile game too. It's just so this marathon doesn't get too long, I'm just going to be looking at the original PS2 trilogy for this, for this next few videos. I'll take a look at the other games in the series at some point, but not now. So let's start with the game that started it all, Ratchet and Clank. So despite being successful for the Insomniac games, you would think you would think that they keep the momentum going, right? You thought wrong? So when Sony was entered the 6th generation of consoles, Insomniac decided to make an entirely new IP called Ratchet and Clank and have other developers take over the Sotrider series with unfortunate results. No worry, I'll get to the PS2 era of Spyro. Just, you're just gonna have to wait a couple more months. And I know I said this in my Jack and Daxter video, but you can literally replace Spyro with Crash and Ratchet with Jack, and you'll literally get the exact same story. It's even up to the point where Ratchet, Spyro, and Crash are still alive and well to this day, while Jack and Daxter are left to rot. And to add insult to injury, Naughty Dog is developing Last of Us 3 and not Jack 4, because this series is a, fa is a franchise's 20th anniversary, and it would make more, so much more sense to develop Last of Us 3 because you all know how well Part 2 did. I'm sorry, I'm still a little bit bitter about that. So let's get into this game story. So we start off on a planet called Core 2, where we meet a robot named Clank, who crash lands on a planet named Evaldin, where he meets Ratchet, a Lombax fixing a spaceship, but he's still missing one crucial tool. You're probably wondering what the fuck a Lombax is. I'm actually not really sure, but let's be real, is it any weirder than a blue hedgehog that can run fast, a bandicoot that wears jeans, or a purple dragon? Why did that sound the weirdest out of the three? Anyway, Clank then shows Ratchet that someone named Chairman Drek is trying to destroy his home planet to make a new one for his race. Of course, Ratchet isn't having that, so, so the two decided to team up and take down Drek. But can I just say that, that this game looks amazing even today? The future race is studying looks the levels look really busy. All this is the PS3 remasters, but even on the PS2, this game's still pretty great looking. The character models have started to show their age. Not to the not a lot, but to the point where it's noticeable. I mean Clank's alright, which is expected because he's a robot. But sometimes Ratchet's eyes just kinda look a little bit too detailed to what are, to the point where it looks kinda weird. Dragon isn't that bad, but he still looks a little bit off though. I think Quark has the worst. He has this really over exaggerated cartoon look with especially facial expressions. His design just screams early PS2 character models. Also, does anyone else find it kinda odd how, how Ratchet has five fingers, but everyone else in, the, in this universe has three? Like, how do fingers work in this universe? Like, do they have two surgically removed? Is it, is it just a Lomax thing? I mean, Quark is probably the most human out of the out of all these robots and aliens, and even he still has three fingers. What the fuck is he? And while I'm on the graphics, let's talk about this game's soundtrack. Sadly, Stuart Copeland, the one who did a, the one who did the soundtrack for Spyro, he didn't return for do to do it for this game. But instead, we got David Bergen. Bigger Burden, sorry if I said that name wrong, and he did an amazing job here. It definitely has that futuristic feel to it that just kind of makes it fit in with the levels and not make it and not make it sound too out of place. So yeah, pretty great soundtrack. I would give it 25 out of 4. And where there's not a lot of story in the first game, at least, you talk to a couple of characters for a few minutes and then run off to do some shooting. But they're not just unimportant characters. Some of them are actually pretty cool and it's pretty funny sometimes. For instance, there's Crap and Quark, who's always fun to watch, especially in the sequels. The plot more who's in every single game in the series, I'm not even joking, and Skidmit Marks, who gives you her hoverboards into a race. 
The character interactions are pretty varied in this game, and because there's so many planets you travel to, they all have their personal problems, and I think that gives them some more reasons for you to want to take down Drek. But this is coming from Exonia, the same people who made the Spyro trilogy, so I think world building would be their thing at this point. Anyway, this is an action adventure game with some platforming from time to time, but it's kind of taken aback for experimentation with some weapons in this game. This series is kind of known for its over the top creative weapon lineup, but here it's pretty basic. There's still some signs from what's to come to the series later, but it's got pretty tame here. When you first start the game, you only have two weapons, the Omni Wrench, which on its own does a pretty good job in taking care of enemies, and the Bomb Glove, which throws bombs. But as you progress, you can buy no more new weapons and ammo by going to the Gadgetron vendors and buying stuff with your bolts, which shouldn't be too hard to find since bolts are everywhere in this game. You get bolts from enemies that just disintegrate, boxes that you'll, that you'll find literally everywhere, and even in ammo. By the time you're done with this game, I guarantee you that you'll have up to 20,000 bolts. And where there's 16 weapons in this game, I already talk about the bomb glove, but there's also the blaster, which does exactly what it sounds, the power tractor, which is pretty much a flamethrower, the suck cannon that can suck out enemies and throw them back at them, the Tesla claw, which fires electricity at enemies. It's a good weapon, but I never really use it that much outside of the final boss, the Morpho Raid that can turn enemies into flowers, the Devastator, which is pretty good for long range aiming, the Walper, which can be good for taking out smaller enemies, but it's a small range weapon, so you're pretty vulnerable when you're cooling down, the decoy club which builds another ratchet so the enemy is distracted by that. The Visa Bomb which shoots out heat seeking missiles and is personally one of my go to weapons in this game. The drone device pops out the little clank bots and decimates any enemy that's in your path. The mine glove, which is pretty much an upgraded version of the of the bomb glove, and that throws out mines and that can also hit home in on enemies. The Taunter, which can call out other robots to break any nearby objects. And lastly, there's the Rhino Gun, which is also known as the Rip You A New One Rep. The Rhino is, a, is an extremely powerful rare missile launcher that can power up to 9 per launch, each of which targets specific enemies and is available for the low low price of 1500 bolts. You also have some gadgets that will help you traverse through different pathways like the Slingshot, the Grind Boots, and the Magma Boots, and the Trespasser, that, and that's only scratching the surface. There's a lot of things to do in this game, and there's a lot of variety of missions to do. There's hoverboard races you can enter, like the skateboard mission in Spyro 3, but this time you're not chasing the dinosaurs around. There's also some dogfights, which are kind of annoying sometimes, but they're not bad. Sprint sections, which I don't really like that much, because honestly, they give me flashbacks from that one mission in Jack 2. You even get to play a humongous version of Clank that demolishes anything that is in its path, which I thought was going to be used in the final boss, but unfortunately wasn't. There's even one level where you can get to play as Ratchet and only Ratchet. You can still use your weapons, but since you can't rely on Clank, it's just pure platforming. Although I don't really like the Clank section of this game that much, to be honest. In a couple of levels, the two will have to split up so Clank can find another way to open up paths for Ratchet. In these levels, Clank's is a little bit slower than Ratchet. He can't double jump, he doesn't have any weapons, which to be fair makes sense. And his only methods of attacking are, are just punching and these old gadget bots. The latter being an army that can follow any of the four commands, wait, follow, enter, attack. I like the concept of the Clank levels, but in execution, it just kind of feels like a pace breaker to me. The game has one and only one main collectible, the Golden Bolts. They're scattered around each world, and there's 40 of them to collect in total. The reward for once you get them all is the ability to purchase golden weapons in the, in the weapons room, Gromlux base, and Novalis. They're pretty much weapon upgrades, but like the blaster can reflect his ammo and, and the protractor has longer range. The skill points also return from the Spyro series acting exactly like it was in there, and honestly, I still don't really feel like getting them all. So I like so I like the gameplay, it's all design and it's just fun. But I kinda wanna say this, and this might be because I'm just bad at the game, but this game was actually a little bit harder than I was expecting it to be. I mean it's not Crash Bandicoot hard, but the game is pretty difficult though. You can't, you can't really chafe in this game, and in a weapons heavy game, that's kind of a problem. You only have 4 hit points, which isn't, which doesn't really sound that bad up when it's up to 4 or 5 enemies, but when there's swarms, that's when it starts to be a problem. And, and it doesn't really help that the fact that checkpoints are really that common. Sometimes when you're making a lot of great progress and then you die because you do something stupid, you have to go all the way back to where you started. Again, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just bad at video games because I never really heard anyone else thinking that this game was hard. But sometimes I actually got mad that I would just rage quit because of some checkpoint bullshit. Anyway, the boss fights in this game are actually pretty good. Some are better than others, but they're still alright. The Alien Queen was pretty easy, I mean you can just literally spam the blaster and you should be good. The Snuggly fight was, might actually be my favorite one since I love the bosses where you have to guide them into the stage hazard. Didn't really like the quirk fight because it included dog fighting and those aren't really too fun for me. The final boss with Drek is more irritating than difficult. I lost the amount of times I died to him. His attacks are pretty hard to dodge and his minions kind of make it even worse. Like I said before, the Tesla Claw makes it way easier to beat this boss since it does more damage than the Devastator. Or you can just use the Rhino and just absolutely decimate him. 
So the bosses are just alright. Uh, so I think that's all I have to say about the gameplay. Let's finish up the story. I'll give you a spoil warning in case you want to experience this story for yourself. I'll wait. When Ratchet and Clank finally come to port, he makes the two go through an obstacle course, but in reality, he's actually working for Drek as a highly paid spokesperson for the chairman's new planet, then leaves the two to die at the hands of the, the Blargian Snackle Beast. Thankfully, they manage to get out of there alive. This causes Ratchet and Clank to drift apart, thinking that the whole deal was his fault, but then eventually become friends again since they're the real superpower of teamwork! They confront Drek and then he revealed that he's only taking out Ratchet's home planet for money. The two defeat Drek and then stop the countdown from that's going to destroy Ratchet's home. But then chunks of the planet start to evolve in, causing the duo to nearly fall to their death and Clank's arm getting badly damaged. Ratchet says that he'll be fine, leaving Clank behind just to fake him out and fix his arm, making the two become best friends. There's also, there's also an after credit scene where this happens. Do you have a problem with unwanted hair? Is painful itching in your nether regions causing you undue embarrassment? Do you just plain stink? Then you need this! The Gadgetron Personal Hygienator! Hi, I'm Steve... McQuark. And this little baby can take care of any grooming needs that are just too much trouble for you to handle yourself. Allow me to demonstrate. Ah, yeah! <laughs> oh, mommy! Turn it off! Turn it off! What the f*** was that? And that was Ratchet and Clank. The game can be frustrating sometimes, the story is pretty average, and has the typical problems the first game in the series it has, but it's still a pretty great game, it has good platforming, fun weapons, and has a lot of great character interactions, which makes the world feel like it has its own personality. The game did really well, and it definitely deserved to, because, because, because Ratchet and Clank as a series sold 3.71 million copies, which isn't really that impressive since, since Precursor Legacy sold, sold 4.2 million copies, but it's still good enough to spawn 2 other sequels and 14 other games in the series. I know there's going to be some people typing this in the comments, I know there's, there are two mobile games and the Ratchet & Clank collection, but most people don't really count it so I won't either. But anyway, it seemed like Insomniac Games made a remark on the PS2 with its first game, and and I think that people who like action adventure platformers like this would get some enjoyment out of the Ratchet & Clank. It's the best selling Ratchet & Clank game on the PS2 and the duo would seem to be a part of the platformer you sure, along with Jack and Daxter and Sly Cooper. Well, it seemed that Naughty Dog and Insomniac were pretty close together during this generation, seeing that some of the credits were to Naughty Dog, and seeing how Jack 2 came out looking, it's clear to see that they had some inspiration. And just to keep it in tradition from Spyro, the credits also show the plants that you visited from before. While it doesn't show them in landscapes, see just seeing them there is just good enough for me. Insomniac clearly knew that he had something going, so they had to make a sequel, and one year later, that's what we got. So I'll see you all next time with Ratchet & Clank going Commando, which was chained in Europe as locked and loaded. But first, I'm gonna awkwardly plug my Twitter and Discord. So if you want to see any of my opinions on certain games or just me posting memes, just you can follow on my Twitter and Instagram. I'm pretty, I'm pretty active on there. So, yeah, and you can also join my Discord. We're not that active, but when we are, we get we tend to have conversations about what Sonic games that we like or what other games we like in general. And we're not a really toxic community, so we won't get attacked for your opinions. And if you're an artist, you can both start and you can, and we can and you can get feedback from us. So anyway, thank you guys for watching and I'll see y'all next time. Peace. can <laughs> pull us up now. The servos in my arm appear to be broken. Broken? As in fall to our deaths broken? Uh, yes.